Nuclear weapons stand to this day as a potent symbol of the human capacity for self-destruction. But in the 76 years since the birth of the atomic bomb, in over 2,000 nuclear explosions, only two have been carried out as part of an overtly hostile act. It's well known that the atomic strikes against Hiroshima and Nagasaki deeply scarred the Japanese psyche and their relationship towards nuclear war. But less well known was a nuclear test in the 1950s that resulted in the accidental contamination of a fishing boat and its crew, and even resulted in one man's death. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look at the Castle Bravo test, the contamination of the Daigo Fukuryu Maru, and how it provided the inspiration for one of the world's greatest nuclear anti-heroes, Gojira. This is the Cold War. Nothing could have satiated Gojira's appetite, but if you are craving some snacks, the sponsor of this video, Boksu, can help you. Boksu offers a uniquely delicious and deliciously unique product, a monthly snack box subscription that partners with century-old family snack makers to deliver exclusive Japanese snacks and tea pairings to your door. Most importantly, it honors Japanese heritage and empowers artisanal makers by partnering with them to deliver authentic flavors around the world. Every month, you'll receive a box with a different theme. The snacks will always be different. It's a gourmet journey through Japan every month. Just order and you will get the best snacks from Japan at home. Boxu offers free shipping to the US. First-time Boxu customers will receive the Seasons of Japan box so they can get a taste of the snacks per season. Repeat customers get a themed box every month, and this month's box is called Summer Fruits. And we can definitely say that it's a favorite of the Cold War team. It's full of fruity goodness, and I am now in love with Mikan Mochi. Use my code COLDWAR20 to get 20% off your first authentic Japanese snack box from Boxu. Take advantage of this limited time offer. March the 1st, 1954. Just 15 minutes before the clock strikes 7, a second sun erupts over Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, the result of the detonation of a US-made thermonuclear bomb. Within a split second, a huge fireball forms, its radius of 7.25 kilometers, that's 4.5 miles for those of you using imperial measurements, engulfing everything in its path, and the now all too familiar mushroom cloud rises and peaks six minutes later, almost 40 kilometers high, about 130,000 feet. The shrimp device, as it was known, created a crater that was just as impressive at two kilometers or 6,500 feet wide and 76 meters deep, that's 250 feet. This was Castle Bravo, the first in a series of high yield thermonuclear weapon design tests conducted by the United States on the Marshall Islands. It is, to this date, the largest nuclear device detonated by the US with a yield of 15 megatons. In comparison, Fat Man and Little Boy, the bombs used on Nagasaki and Hiroshima respectively, looked like firecrackers, with Castle Bravo being 1,000 times more powerful. The flash of the explosion was so strong that it would have been visible from the surface of Mars. Now, the size of the explosion was actually unexpected. Originally, it had been estimated that the explosion would produce the energy equivalent of 5 megatons. That's three times smaller than the actual yield that was produced. Investigations after the test revealed that the design team at Los Alamos had made a mistake in their calculations. The shrimp design was the same general design as the Ivy Mike shot, but instead of using cryogenic liquid deuterium for fuel to sustain the thermonuclear reaction, it used lithium deuteride, which was a solid at room temperature. The lithium deuteride was made up of two forms of lithium, lithium-6 and lithium-7. The lithium-6 was to act as the fuel to sustain the reaction, while the lithium-7, which made up 60% of the total lithium content, was assumed to be inert, meaning it wouldn't react. They were wrong in this assumption, and the error would result in the worst radiological disaster in American history. As the resulting explosion was several times larger than the one anticipated, the scientific instruments that had been placed on the island to measure various parameters were almost instantly vaporized, and thus were unable to be recovered, while others simply failed to transmit their data. Thus, little of the desired diagnostic information was collected. 
However, the loss of the scientific equipment and the destruction of permanent buildings on the island was nothing compared to the humanitarian tragedy that would follow. The explosion disintegrated the coral reef surrounding the blast site, and that debris was sucked up into the mushroom cloud, becoming irradiated in the process. Of course, what goes up must come down, and in this case, what came down was nuclear fallout. The unexpected power of the bomb, coupled with errors in foreseeing and analyzing weather patterns, including wind direction, had rendered the designated exclusion zone obsolete. The radioactive fallout would spread over a much larger area which included the Rongelap, Alingane, and Uteric atolls, exposing the native islanders there, as well as US servicemen, to high levels of radiation. The evacuation of the Marshallese islanders did not begin until two days later, however, by which time they had been exposed to radiation doses as high as 175 rad. The populations of the surrounding atolls would not be allowed back to their homes for several years, and even after their return was allowed, many suffered from continued exposure to radioactive contamination. The islanders were also secretly studied by the US military in an experiment designed to monitor the long-term effects of radiation exposure. These studies were carried out largely without the consent or even knowledge of the islanders themselves. The American ships that were stationed 30 miles to the south of the atoll in order to observe the Castle Bravo shot were also exposed to the fallout. However, as they were largely aware of the nature of the fine dust that had started blanketing the vessels like snow, the personnel retreated below decks and the ships moved to a safer distance. That would not be the case for a Japanese fishing boat named Daigo Fukuryu Maru that happened to be inside the new fallout zone and was completely unaware of their suddenly dire situation. Ironically, the ship's name is translated into English as Lucky Dragon No. 5. However, both the vessel and the crew's fate would be far from lucky. Only her fifth voyage, it was going to be her final one as well, as the radiation she received meant she could no longer be safely used in the future. She had set sail from the port of Yaizu in Shizuoka Prefecture on the 19th of January, and her original fishing spot was close to Midway Atoll, far away from the nuclear test site of Operation Castle. But there the first calamity struck, as they lost most of their trawl nets because of a coral reef, and so they changed course and headed southwards towards the Marshall Islands, not wanting to return to Japan empty-handed. Empty-netted? Anyway, on March 1st, they would encounter the nuclear fallout created by America's strongest nuclear weapon at the time. Oishi Matashichi, who passed away only in March of this year, was one of the crew members of the unlucky vessel and would later recall this incident in his book. It was just like sleet, as it accumulated on deck, our feet left footprints. This silent white stuff that stole up on us as we worked was the devil incarnate, born of science. The white particles penetrated mercilessly, eyes, nose, ears, mouth. It turned the heads of those wearing headbands white. We had no sense that it was dangerous. It wasn't hot. It had no odor. I took a lick. It was gritty but had no taste. We had turned into the wind to pull in the lines, so a lot got down our necks, into our underwear, and into our eyes, and it prickled and stung. Rubbing our inflamed eyes, we kept at our tough task. The task on hand being, of course, the retrieval of their fishing gear. In hindsight, we can say that it would have been better if they had abandoned it and escaped the follow zone as soon as possible, as it took them nearly six hours to retrieve their nets, all the while being exposed to tremendous levels of radiation from what they would later call Shinohai, death ash. Furthermore, it wasn't just the fishermen that were exposed to this poisonous ash, but their catch became contaminated as well. One of the sailors came up with the idea of keeping some of the ash in a pouch to have it analyzed by scientists back in Japan, unaware that it too would have hazardous effects on the men's health, though those must have been negligible compared to the literal fallout shower they had experienced earlier. It's estimated that they had received around 300 ronchen of radiation, and although it wasn't enough to be a lethal dose, it's not hard to imagine that it would be the probable source of many health problems that would cause great suffering for the men of the Lucky Dragon number 5. The crew began to show radiation poisoning symptoms as early as the evening of the same day. 
These early symptoms included nausea, headaches, body pain, and diarrhea, and they only got worse with each passing day of their return journey. By the time they made port on March 14th, much of their hair had fallen out, and they had developed blisters on parts of their body. It didn't take long for the Japanese doctors, who had extensive experience with the effects of radiation on the human body, thanks to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to conclude that the crew was suffering from radiation illness. American officials, who also examined the fishermen, were not as worried, and dismissed the exposure as trivial, perhaps in an attempt to conceal the nature of the weapon the US had developed and used, as well as their miscalculation in the size of the yield. The United States was actually deeply concerned about a possible leak of thermonuclear technology to the Soviets. The head of the US Atomic Energy Commission, Louis Strauss, in a private conversation with President Eisenhower's press secretary, expressed his belief that the tuna boat might have been, in fact, a red spy ship, something he even implied in a public press statement on March 31st. Congressman William Sterling Cole, who on March 17th had already accused the Lucky Dragon of intentionally entering the exclusion zone in order to spy on the tests, would repeat that statement on the same day as Strauss's press release. Over the following months, diplomatic relations between Japan and the United States were strained as the US repeatedly tried to downplay the situation and absolve themselves from any responsibility for the disaster, claiming that the ship had intentionally entered the danger zone and blaming the deteriorating health of the crew to bad treatment from hospital staff. In the end, the American government grudgingly agreed to pay a consolation fee. Each crew member received the equivalent of around $53,000 at today's exchange rate, a pittance relative to the struggles with diseases such as cancer that each of the crewmen faced for the rest of their lives. And certainly no compensation for Kubayama Aikichi, who had been the boat's chief radioman, who died of complications from a hepatitis infection and cirrhosis of the liver aggravated by the radiation poisoning. As the diplomatic game between the United States and Japan was going on, each blaming the other for the incident, panic and fear had spread throughout Japan as 17 of the tuna from the ship's contaminated catch had made their way to the fish market in Osaka, two of them having already been sold and even consumed. The authorities proceeded to check the remaining fish using Geiger counters, only to discover that all of them showed high levels of radioactivity. From then on, all fish arriving at Osaka were subjected to inspections, and it was soon discovered that Lucky Dragon was not the only ship to return with a contaminated catch. The Ministry of Health and Welfare would later state that 856 Japanese fishing vessels and around 20,000 sailors had been exposed to radiation from the Castle Bravo test. The price of tuna plunged over fears of radioactive contamination, and many fisheries in Tokyo went out of business. From March to December of that year, some 75 tons of tuna were found to be unfit for consumption and thus were disposed of. Moreover, food companies from all over the globe decided to stop fish imports from Japan, further damaging the Japanese fishing industry. The Lucky Dragon incident and the fate of its crew reinforced the anti-nuclear sentiment that had been growing in Japan since the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Up until April 1952, the Supreme Command of the Allied Powers, ESCAP, had successfully suppressed information regarding the long-term effects from radiation, but since then, more and more information had become available to the Japanese public. Following the Castle Bravo incident, an anti-nuclear testing signature campaign was launched in Tokyo on Hiroshima Day, which managed to gather more than 32 million signatures. The following year, the first World Conference Against Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs was held in Hiroshima. This conference inspired Japanese anti-nuclear activists to found the Japan Council Against Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs, Gensu Kyu, that continues its action to this day. But it wasn't only political action that was inspired by the Castle Bravo accident. The cultural world was mobilized as well. Artist Taro Okamoto, inspired by the incident, painted the Moero Hito, Burning People, which was displayed at the World Conference Against Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs in 1959. Later, he also included the Lucky Dragon No. 5 in his mural, Myth of Tomorrow, which is now on display in Tokyo's Shibuya Railway Station. In 1959, 
Kenero Shindo would write and direct a film adaptation of the events in his movie Daigo Fukuryu Maru. But of all the anti-nuclear Japanese art and movies that were produced, one would rise to become a global cultural phenomenon. The protagonist of this film is a humongous radioactive monster resembling a dinosaur, and his name is quite famous, Gojira, or as he's become known in English, Godzilla. The very first movie, simply titled Gojira, was released in Japan in November 1954, only eight months since the events of Castle Bravo and The Lucky Dragon. Contrary to the sequels, which may come off as kitschy, it's a very well-crafted movie and has a very clear anti-war message. The opening scenes are a direct reference to The Lucky Dragon. The fishermen of a small boat in the Pacific are tending to their tasks when the sea starts to boil and following a blinding flash of light, the ship bursts into flames. The connection between Godzilla and nuclear weapons was made clear by both Tomoyuki Tanaka, the film's producer, and its director, Ishiro Honda. In Tanaka's own words, the theme of the film from the beginning was the terror of the bomb. Mankind had created the bomb, and now nature was going to take revenge on mankind. In Honda's mind, Godzilla was not just a symbol that stood for nuclear weapons. It was a physical manifestation of the weapons themselves. If Godzilla had been a dinosaur or some other animal, he would have been killed by just one cannonball. But if he were equal to an atomic bomb, we wouldn't know what to do. So I took the characteristics of an atomic bomb and applied them to Godzilla. This is the reason why no conventional weapons can stop Godzilla from wreaking havoc in the city of Tokyo. To defeat him, a Japanese scientist develops an equally terrifying weapon, a device that consumes all oxygen in the water and in the process skeletonizes all living beings in the area. Before descending into the sea to face Godzilla, he destroys all the information that could lead to the remaking of his weapon. Once he's in the waters of Tokyo Bay, he detonates the device, killing Godzilla and himself in the process, and takes the secret of the new weapon with him to the grave. This is also the final message of the film. For mankind to survive, weapons of mass destruction must cease to exist. However, Godzilla is just a piece of cinematography, and couldn't make either of the two superpowers rethink their policies regarding nuclear weapons and the atmospheric tests they conducted. Despite the international uproar Castle Bravo caused, the US government proceeded with a further five high-yield thermonuclear tests on the Marshall Islands in the same year. And as more and more countries joined the nuclear club, more and more tests have been conducted. Tests that caused irreparable environmental damage and great suffering to those unlucky enough to get caught in the radiation zone. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have enlisted the service of a giant moth, a giant turtle, and Mecha Streisand in order to help press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're also active on Facebook and Instagram at the Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War or through YouTube membership. And don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it gets heated. <laughs>